Hi everyone. We will be starting the webinar in about nine minutes time. We'll just give enough time for everyone to log in. Let me know where you are dining in from today. I'm in sunny Herefordshire, which is nice compared to last week where it was a lot of rain. Um, you can use the chat function with the icon that should be below your screen, which will allow you to type into there. You can also use that function throughout the webinar if you do have any questions. We will do a short Q&A at the end, but if you have any questions in between, do pop them in there and we can try and answer them or we'll save them for the end. Hi to those that have just joined. We are just waiting for everyone to get logged in. Let me know where you are dialing in from today. As I just mentioned, I'm in Herefordshire, where the sun is shining. So I think it's meant to be a good week for weather. I hope it's nice where you are. Hi, Derka from Singapore. As I just mentioned, you can use the chat function, which is a little icon below your screen, if you do want to send any questions or let me know where you're dining in from. Um, there's also the Q&A function, which if you have any questions, just pop them in there and we'll either try and answer them throughout or we can answer them at the end for you. Hi, Marianne from Holland. Well, she's got sunshine too. She's just asked if the webinar will be recorded and yes, the webinar is being recorded. So we will send you a link to the recording um, either later this evening or tomorrow morning when we get that link from Zoom. Marianne's just said that it's a bank holiday there. <laughs> bank holiday too in the UK this Friday, which it got moved from a Monday actually. I think it was because of the Queen. <laughs> but I don't think she planned the coronavirus. <laughs> Hi everyone just joining. We are just waiting probably about another five minutes to let everyone get joined onto the call. Let me know where you're calling from today. You can pop it in the chat box below. As I just mentioned, I'm in Herefordshire, where the weather is very lovely here today. Lots of blue skies. If you do have any questions throughout the webinar, we are very happy to answer any. So just pop them in the chat box and we'll see if we can catch them as they come through. Or if not, we'll collect them and answer as many as we can at the end. Hi, Peter in Watford. So I can still see people logging in. We'll give it another five minutes. We've got time to go and grab a drink or a coffee, <laughs> ready for the webinar. Hi to those that have just logged in. We will be starting the webinar in about five minutes time. You know, just giving enough time for everyone to get logged on. I hope you're all doing okay today. Let me know where you're dining in from. So far we've got Singapore, Holland, UK. We've got Ed Edward, I hope I said that right, from Brazil. We've got the James in the UK. We've got 
Senda from Czech Republic. Turning on. Hi to those that have just joined. We will be starting the webinar in just a couple of minutes' time. We're just letting everyone get logged in. I think we've got quite a few of you joining us today. If you've just joined us, let me know where you're calling from today. You can pop it in the chat box below. You can also use this if you have any questions throughout the webinar and we'll be very happy to answer as many as we can. Just so you all know, the webinar will be recorded, so you will have a link to access the recording afterwards if you want to watch it again or share with your colleagues as well. I'm sure we find it very useful. Hi Kiram in India from Salt Systems. Hi Alan, who's in southwest London. Hi Jason, who's in Barrow in Surrey. Hi Andrea from Romania. Hi to those that just joined. We are starting the webinar in just a couple minutes time. We'll give another two minutes or so to let everyone get logged in. I can see the number joining is still going up. Hi Paul. To those of you that have just joined, um, I've just mentioned that if you do have any questions throughout the webinar, you can pop it in the chat function or there's also a Q&A function below um, where you can pop your questions in there. We'll try and answer as many as we can, either throughout if we see them or um, at the end as well, we'll gather them together. Hi everyone just joining. We are probably going to start in about a minute's time. We'll just wait for the hour so that everyone's kind of logged in. Let me know where you're calling from today. You can pop it in the chat box below. I'm in Herefordshire. Currently working from home. But it has been lovely and sunny actually this week, which has made evening walks very nice. It was quite rainy last week. Right, okay, so I think we'll get started. So, hi everyone, my name's Rachel. I am the Marketing Manager here at Imparta and I'd like to welcome you all today. So I hope you are all doing okay and coping the best you can under the current circumstances. It's a very difficult and challenging time for everyone right now. So today's webinar follows on from our last webinar series which was on the critical sales skills for the COVID-19 pandemic. If you did miss that one you can catch it on our website which is under resources and videos. So in today's webinar, we will focus on how to handle those business critical conversations which have been triggered by the COVID 
pandemic. So I'm delighted to introduce your host today, Richard Barkey. Richard Barkey is a thought leader in sales, strategy and learning. Richard holds a first class degree in engineering from Cambridge University and as well as an MBA with distinction from Harvard Business School. Richard is a sought after keynote speaker and runs sales strategy workshops and high profile deal and account coaching sessions for imparted clients all around the world. So, I'll pass it over to you, Richard. Rachel, hi and hello to everybody. Uh, my apologies, I just had a very untimely computer crash, so if you give me one second, I'm just getting no, myself no. back into uh, position here. There we are. Can you see me? Hi. Yeah. <laughs> my apologies for that. Um, so welcome everybody. Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, thank you very much for joining us um, for uh, the second in our kind of series of webinars that we've been running since March. So I'm just gonna share the slides again, which hopefully now you can see. Is that okay, Rachel? Yeah. Perfect, thank you. So yeah, we've been running webinars since March to help clients and, and the wider sales community uh, to tackle some of the issues that the pandemic has created. And I guess when we started back in March, most organizations were still responding to the initial crisis and the initial fallout uh, of the pandemic. And I'm pleased to say that now we are seeing more and more clients and their customers thinking ahead and starting to be planning for the recovery or at the very least planning for what the new normal is going to look like. But over that period, a number of business critical issues have been emerging from how you handle clients or customers that are paying slowly or defaulting on their payments, how you handle requests for price cuts, how you protect renewals against potential cancellation of longer term ongoing contracts and so on. And so this webinar is really about how it's a more focused one than the first series of webinars we ran, but it's all about how you deal with those very specific current business critical interventions. So what we're gonna cover over the, the next hour or so is first of all, just to talk about what those business critical issues are right now, to really delve a little bit into the cost of not acting, what it's costing us to, to not deal properly with requests for price cuts, for example, then talk about how we get people to change their behavior at a time when headspace is in short supply and people are under a great deal of pressure. And then we're gonna deep dive into three of the 12 um, business critical issues that we've identified in collaboration with clients and, and colleagues. Um, and the three we're going to look into in more detail are managing requests for price cuts and increased payment terms, handling overdue or bad debt, and finally, from the procurement point of view, how you in turn can try to drive some cost reductions to help with your margins, cash flow and flexibility. So we'll take questions as we go. Um, I would encourage you to uh, to put questions into the chat box or the Q&A box and um, Rachel will pass those across to me uh, and I'll, I'll try and keep an eye on those two um, uh, ways of communicating as we go through. There's also going to be time at the end for a proper Q&A session. So let's talk about then what these business critical issues actually are and clearly coronavirus um, has made us adjust many aspects of life from working from home. Um, I'm here in my study in Warwickshire right now, and I think most of us probably haven't left the rooms we're doing Zoom or WebEx calls on for a while now. Um, we're clearly having to deal with some staff being furloughed and so on. But the impact of coronavirus has gone well beyond that, and it's changed almost every aspect of the way customers buy, and therefore how we must sell. So just to put a bit of context before I get into the, the issues, the best way to think about how customers buy is what we call the buying cycle. And the buying cycle, for those of you who, who know this already, my apologies, but just very quickly, it begins with a customer or a client, depending on your terminology, recognizing that they have a need, either for something new or to change a supplier or process that they currently use. Then they move into the choose phase where they identify the various options they have for meeting that need. 
and choose the one that fits their criteria the best. At that point, they then start to worry about what might go wrong at a number of different levels. Strategically, and these days, that's often about, is my supplier that I choose going to be around in a year's time? Tactically, politically, and even individually. Then there's a process of commitment to actually doing a deal. And that often is where the classical negotiation happens around price and contract terms. Then there's an adoption phase. And then ultimately, there's a renewal, if you're, if you're good, and an expansion, if you're better, of the relationship between the supplier and the customer. So that's the, the overall playing space in which we operate, I guess. And the skills that we need as salespeople and sales leaders to deliver, obviously, they, they differ around the buying cycle. And it's important to know not where you are in your linear sales process, but where the customer is in their journey because our job is to bring insight and to influence the customer through that process so normally um, at imparta we have a curriculum that runs all the way around that buying cycle so we we begin with kind of prospecting in the need phase creating client value is our core opportunity management program that spans you know defining the need better choose and worry there's commercial acumen and negotiation that happens at the commit stage right through to customer experience and customer success and renewals and account management later on in the buying cycle. And we have a, a modular curriculum, which um, actually involves a, a physical card deck as a way of figuring out which modules you want to use. And that's something we deliver through e-learning. And it used to be face-to-face -face training. Now it's all obviously virtual instructor-led training as well. So that's how things were. But and, and, and we're still doing a lot of that work with global clients, but more and more now we're being asked to help with these really specific issues that are cropping up day to day for people within client organizations. And the reason I wanted to introduce the buying cycle is I think it's useful to place those issues around the buying cycle rather than just to list them. So in the need phase, the two big things that we're seeing is firstly a need to refill the pipeline, which has been um, destroyed in some cases, but almost all cases at least damaged by the coronavirus and the fallout from that. But not just to refill the pipeline, I think people are finding that getting to the point where a customer commits to making at least a decision, if not to what the final decision is, is still proving quite difficult. And we're seeing a lot of decisions being escalated more and more to the C-suite, where perhaps they wouldn't have been before, and that has two effects. One is it's changing the ROI um, hurdle that you have to reach in order to get a decision. And it's also bottlenecking that decision process. So you really need to have a compelling case to get past that need stage and into the point where a customer is thinking of issuing an RFI or an RFP. So the second um, business critical issue is demonstrating ROI in a really clear way but in a way that doesn't damage your credibility by overestimating what you can achieve. Then in the choose phase, we are finding that the virtual pitch is a very different environment to the face-to-face -face pitch. And uh, the, the same principles apply of applying behavioral economics and psychology as well as decision strategy. But the way you do that and the importance of doing that has changed through the virus. So the third critical issue for many clients is winning virtual pitches. And then in the worry stage, a lot of deals are stalling, not at this time because the ROI wasn't there, but because people are just getting log jammed in thinking about what could go wrong and in risk assessment. And so unlocking stalled deals at the worry stage is the fourth thing. Then in commit, a lot of organizations are putting increasing pressure on uh, their suppliers to reduce prices and um, improve terms in that negotiation process. So defending value against professional procurement teams is the fifth thing that's coming up in our, in our view as being super critical right now. Um, then in the adopt phase, a lot of uh, customer service people and salespeople when it's escalated to them are having to have much harder conversations uh, than they perhaps had to before around things like service issues um, and 
in the second we'll talk about collections, but primarily around things that are not going as well as they could, uh, at a time when tension is high, both for the customer and for the service person. So having resilient conversations is um, another very important issue that's coming up right now. And then handling overdue payments. So um, there are situations where customers are not able to pay or not willing to pay. So the way you have those conversations and handle uh, late or even delinquent payments is extremely important. And then in the renew stage, managing demands for reductions in price or extensions of payment terms is one of the most common things we're hearing. And in reality, that actually can happen at any stage of the buying cycle, but it tends to be you know, with existing customers coming back to you and asking for help on price and terms. Um, and then uh, finally, just in the renewal stage, avoiding cancellation. So I've said for a while now that I think there is a ticking time bomb coming down the track, which is a lot of organizations rely on annual recurring revenue. And we haven't yet had many renewal processes happening during the time of coronavirus. This hasn't been going on for that long, believe it or not. It feels like it has. Um, but I think, you know, as people hit renewal points, those renewals are going to turn into rethinks. And therefore, it's extremely important that we get ahead of the game on that and um, start to figure out how we can avoid people cancelling because they need to conserve cash. So those are the things around the buying cycle that we're hearing more and more are critical. And there are, there are a number of other things that we put in the middle of the cycle here that are just general skills that seem to be critical right now. So one is mastering virtual presence. How can you build your presence in this new Zoom or WebEx based world or BlueJeans or whatever your, um, your favorite tool is and do that in a way that creates a human link builds rapport, builds engagement, builds trust, and is effective as a way of selling. Then there's kind of how you sell virtually, which is an extension of that. So mastering virtual presence is very much focused on how you deal with the medium. Selling is how you influence people through that medium. And then there are two other things, how you manage a virtual team and how you reduce costs yourself through your own procurement team. So there's quite a few of these things, and there may well be more uh, that you have, but these are the ones that seem to us to be the things that we were hearing most often around, you know, what, what are the issues that, that um, our clients and others in the industry are, are finding. So we've now created uh, interventions for each of these. And in fact, we're releasing today an update for the um, imparta.com website that should um, give you some insight into what kinds of skills we think you would need to deal with each of these areas. And, and hopefully, you know, even if you don't want to work with Imparta, that will give you some guidance as to you know, clarity on what these issues are and some of the skills you might need to address them. The thing here is that these are not kind of two-day courses or five-day courses. These are short, sharp interventions that, that you know, maybe take a couple of hours, but really give people the skills and the tools they need to deal with these current critical issues. So what we're gonna focus on today, as I mentioned in the deep dive section of this, is three, just to give you some ideas and to help you with three things that we're seeing quite commonly. Obviously, I won't be able to kind of transmit everything that we would train people in, but hopefully give you a really good start in managing demands for price cuts and extensions of terms, handling overdue payments, and finally reducing costs through your own procurement team. But before I do that, I just wanted to, um, to ask a question really of, of you. We have 337 people on this webinar so far. So it'd be interesting to get some feedback from you guys, which is really which of these issues um, that we've listed here are um, are you experiencing right now, either as a salesperson yourself or as a sales manager or a sales leader? So, Rachel, could I ask you to put the first poll up, please? There we go. So um, I've combined a couple of these because Zoom has a limit of 10 questions that you can ask. Um, and you can choose more than one of these options. So if I could ask you just to pop onto that poll and just select all of the ones that you feel are issues for your organization at the moment um, and, and give us that input. And um, you know, the, 
the goal for this is twofold, I guess. One is to make this not just a, me talking for an hour, <laughs> but to involve you. But also it helps us to understand where we should be investing our time and energy first in building out these solutions. Um, and also to kind of benchmark where uh, the issues are being felt most in industry at the moment. Um, while we do that, there was a question that came in earlier from Dinakar. Uh, how do we handle the Forex exchange impact? For example, Australian dollar versus US dollar, um, which, can, which in effect can create a price change. How do we realize this impact or neutralize it? So uh, Dinakar, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, when we talk about price and terms uh, a bit later in the webinar, I'll come back to that point if I may and, and just um, address it then. But in, at a high level, I think, in effect, whether that price cut is being requested because the customer is, um, is experiencing their own issues or because the exchange rate has changed, your strategy for dealing with it is probably very similar. Okay, so we've got about 230, 240 people have responded so far. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, let us, we'll put a pause on that. I'll just give you a couple more seconds if you're still working on that. Okay, Rachel, let's show the results of that poll if we could, please. Thank you very much. So the biggest issue, um, there are three big ones. One is refilling the pipeline. So over half of you a feeling that refilling the pipeline is a critical issue right now. 50% uh, are saying customer demands for price cuts and uh, payment extensions. And 48% this issue around um, contract cancellations and protecting renewals. Uh, only 12% saying they're interested in reducing costs through their own procurement teams. Now that is one of the three areas that we're talking about in this, but maybe if we do this again, uh, I'll take account of your preferences here and adjust the deep dive slightly. Um, but certainly, you know, it feels as though none of these issues are not happening. And clearly there are a number of uh, them that are more significant. So virtual selling and sales management um, is also uh, key. So thank you very much for that. We will be sending around a link to the recording of this webinar along with a PDF, if you ask for it, of the, the slides. But we'll also send the poll results. Um, because I think it's quite useful to be able to benchmark where you stand against other organizations. So, um, Rachel, thank you very much for that indeed. Um, I think we hadn't actually shared the results, so maybe we, we just stopped doing that. Okay. Okay, so let's, let's just talk about the cost of not acting around some of these issues. And um, th th there are some fairly straightforward calculations that you can do for yourself uh, to, um, in order to estimate what the cost of not acting is. So Nina is saying that some people are being asked for a password to join. I think Rachel, yeah, Zoom has changed their rules recently so that they all, every meeting has a password on it. But I think we did send that around. But Rachel, um, if you're there, maybe we could just resend that to attendees. And Rachel is saying that the password is 103015. It is in the email. Um, but if anybody can't get in, the password is 103015. Okay, so let's just take an example company to, to have a look at some of these costs of not acting. Um, and this is, again, just a, a kind of a typical company. Uh, the currency can be whatever your local currency is, whether it's dollars or pounds or euros or yen or, or whatever you fancy. Um, so I'm saying here this company in 2019 was about 4.6 billion, whatever the currency unit is, of which about a quarter was new logos versus recurring revenue. Their gross margin is about 25%. So they're a, uh, they're a manufacturing company, this company. Gross profit, therefore, about 1.15 billion. Operating costs of 550 million. And EBIT, earnings before interest and tax, of about 600. And then their balance sheet, they've got accounts receivable of about 530, bad debt of 26 million, 100 million in cash, and, and the calculation of their days receivable, which is obviously accounts receivable divided by revenue multiplied by 365, that comes out to 42. So on average, they've got 42 days worth of revenue that's outstanding. 
So that, that's an example company. For some of you, that's much bigger than you. Uh, for some, it's much smaller than you, but a typical, you know, decent sized organization. And let's look at the impact now of not acting if they're being asked for price cuts. So let's say that on average, an organization of that size um, is asked by a number of customers, maybe 20% of customers for a 5% price cut, or all customers for 1%. Again, this is just illustrative. But a 1% price cut for that organization across the board would be a 46 million pounds or dollars or whatever you want uh, reduction in EBIT. Um, and that is because it's only a 1% price cut, but there's a leverage effect because obviously if you just change the price, your variable costs don't go down. So a 1% price cut in this case creates an 8% fall in EBIT. But it has an even bigger impact on cash because there's all sorts of cash flows going in and out of the organization. In this example, that 46 million would actually be 46% less cash available at the end of the year, assuming that everything else stays the same. So a 1% or even a small price cut can have a really big leverage effect across an organization. And equally, if we think about payment terms, a five day, let's say, increase in days receivable. So if, if you know, companies are able to negotiate with that organization um, a, a change from say 30 day or 40 day payment terms to 45 day payment terms, which doesn't sound a huge amount, but that, if you, if you take five days divided by the 365 days in the year and multiply it by their revenue, is actually 63 million pounds less cash available to that organization than they would otherwise have had, which is a 63% reduction. So the, the key takeaway here is not so much the specific numbers, because obviously your numbers will, will vary, but with some very simple calculations, you can say, what's the cost of not fixing these problems? And in most cases, the cost of not fixing the problems is very much more than the cost of fixing the problems. And I think it's worth saying that the, the impact of your effort in sorting things out, like coming up with a way for organizations to push back against customer requests for price cuts, for example, is nonlinear. So you're always competing against something, whether it's the do nothing scenario or the procurement team or a competitor, and there's often a transition point where your skill and effort is enough to swing the balance and suddenly you're able to resist the price cut, um, whereas before you weren't. So these critical interventions have potentially quite dramatic impact, positive impact on your business. Uh, and it's not a linear relationship between how much effort you put in to fixing these things and what kind of a result you can get often quite small interventions can have quite a big impact on your outcomes. So the challenge though, is that um, a lot of organizations are under a lot of pressure and a lot of salespeople are under a lot of pressure and don't really feel able to invest the time in training, even though it's clear that they're overloaded partly because they're having to sort out issues that they're not fully equipped to deal with. So I want to talk a little bit now about how you, before we get into the deep dives, how you drive change. Um, uh, <laughs> the question from Ian, I'll come back to in one second, how you drive change under pressure. So um, I'm, I, 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 I do have a bicycle. I wouldn't call myself a cyclist, Ian, but marginal great gains, yes, came from Dave Brailsford, who is the, um, the, the manager of the, or was the manager of the GB cycling team. And, and that was his strategy for, um, for winning so many gold medals. And indeed, Clive Woodward, uh, when we won the Gold Cup in uh, the World Cup in rugby, had a similar approach of marginal gains. So doing lots of things a little bit better. So change under pressure. I'm going to ask you another question now, which is, are your frontline staff, or if you are on the frontline yourself, are you willing and able to invest a few hours in some training that would help you to deal with um, some of these critical issues coming up. So Rachel, if we could share the second poll, please. So um, please be open with this because I'm, I'm actually interested to see how much of a barrier there is for people to do things that will help them with this kind of issue. So um, do you think this would not be a good use of their time or your time? Um, you or they would need convincing to invest their time 
or people would value help with the issues they're struggling with, or actually you're already doing this. So interestingly, most people are saying that the frontline teams would value help with the issues they are struggling with, which is good. Um, very few think this would be a good use of time, which I'm very pleased to see. Uh, not just for our sake, but because I think, I think it is a good use of people's time, whoever does the training. Um, and 22% roughly are saying that, yeah, people would need convincing um, in order to invest their time. So Rachel, let, let's share those results. Um, hopefully you guys can see that. So 61% would value help with the issues they're struggling with. 22% uh, would need some convincing and 16% are already doing this kind of thing. So well done to you guys. Um, and I think, you know, there's a sizable minority therefore who might need a bit of convincing that this is a good, a good thing to do. So let me just spend a, a few minutes talking about how to do that. Um, thanks for the poll, Rachel. Um, and I'm guessing that this little section is probably of more interest to um, L&D and sales leaders and, um, uh, and uh, individual kind of sales enablement teams rather than necessarily sales people, but we'll move on to the, the, the kind of crunchy sales content in a second. Uh, Deborah is saying it's not just the investment of time, but also the investment of money. And clearly, um, you know, budgets are tight across the board. Um, the only thing I can say to that, Deborah, is that we're more than happy to work on a success basis. <laughs> So how do you get people to overcome the, what I'm calling the headspace bottleneck, you know, and, and maybe we should also say the investment bottleneck given uh, Deborah's point there. And if I go back to the buying cycle, it's really interesting. You can apply the buying cycle to the change process as well, because when you think about it, salespeople are customers for any kind of intervention that you're using to help them to do their job better. So in the need phase, I think it's important to establish what needs to change and why. So to build that felt need and any good change process usually starts with, you know, what's the need? Why do we have to change? What's going wrong that's not supportable at the moment? In the choose phase, we're sort of asking people to invest either money or time in some kind of a solution here. So that's a question to ask. And what kind of return on investment would you need to see for that to feel worthwhile. And that's where the kind of calculations we talked about earlier will be helpful. In the worry stage, it's important to uncover any concerns that people have, maybe about effectiveness or time or follow through, whatever those might be. In, in kind of commit and adopt, it's the actual training. And then at the end of the adopt phase, manager coaching is always critical in any kind of sales improvement. So goal-based coaching where you're not just saying, are you doing the skill, but what are you trying to achieve in an account on a particular deal and how can these things help? And then in the renewal and expansion process, understanding what's working, what's not, and what else do you need? And with through all of that, um, and the reason I started by saying, you know, what is the cost of not acting is there is a, 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 an approach or a, a behavior that I've spoken about a number of times on these webinars which is loss aversion. So the psychology says that people tend to act to avoid a loss two to four times more than they do to achieve a gain. And you can see that on this graph where the perceived value of a gain is less than the perceived negative value from a loss. So rather than saying, let's do this because there's a positive impact, then it's worth focusing on what's the gain, sorry, what's the pain from not acting. So if we can build a bit of urgency, what's the right approach to, um, to actually training people up and, and figuring out how you can um, get people to improve these skills? And Tony is asking how this approach translates to a more product-based sales team. And I, I think um, some of the things I'm talking about here are more about how you do major contract sales, but a number of them actually relate quite well to product-based, more transactional selling. And I'll try, Tony, I'll try and pull those things out as we go through. So the, the problem with e-learning, and e-learning is obviously one of the ways you can do training right now. Um, but the problem with e-learning, and this is some research we did with trainingindustry.com um, that showed that 71% of, of companies felt that uh, sales training is something that saves money. And also right now is possible under lockdown. 
about half of people prefer e-learning to face-to-face -face training, but only a third felt that training through e-learning is actually very effective as a way to build skills. And that's a fairly accurate <laughs> assessment, I think, because most e-learning is just, you know, watch this video, read this thing, and answer some quiz questions. So the way we um, put these business critical interventions together is designed to, to reflect that kind of change process that I talked about before. And again, I'm not, I'm not really trying to pitch our approach here, just to say, however you do this, it's worth thinking about more than just putting some training in place, but think about the pieces that have to go before and after that. So we start this with, um, for each of these interventions, a teaser campaign. So there are email templates and animations that build that felt need, the motivation to change and improve. Um, there are video scenarios that illustrate the difference between good and bad performance. So if you're dealing with a request for a price cut, here's how not to do it, and here's how to do it. And then we break that down through e-learning, actually, or um, virtual instructor-led in some cases, to explain how to do things. Um, uh, what have I done? I think I've just paused my screen share, but oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, and uh, you get some videos of me talking about some of the nuanced aspects of how to put these skills into practice. Then there are kind of canvases that are account planning tools or deal planning tools, manager coaching toolkits, um, on-demand coaching. There's a kind of pay-as-you-go service that we offer called on-demand coaching. So if you've got a particular um, issue that you want to figure out, you can just book a session and have somebody talk that through with you. And then critically, measuring the impact against a certain number of KPIs and feeding that back into the organization to create a bit of buzz around how to make this stuff stick. So whether you apply you know, that exact framework, I think the key takeaway here is, if you're trying to get people to change their behavior, think about it as a, a lean mini change process and really drive you know, both the, the initial communication and the communication at the end to say, look, so-and-so did this and the impact was really positive, so give it a go. Okay, with that said, let's now, um, let's now dive into these three areas and let's talk about how we deal with um, requests for price cuts and extended payment terms. Before I do that, just let me just pause quickly and ask if there are any questions up to this point. Uh, if there are, just pop them into the chat window or the Q&A window and I'll come back to them. Okay, so imagine the situation. You are um, in a relationship with an organization and you get a letter from them saying, uh, I'd like, you know, we've, we've reviewed all of our suppliers and we are now implementing an extension of payment terms to 60 days and a 3% across the board price cut. How do you respond to that, right? And I think my first advice is to say, sorry, we can't do that. Um, we'll talk in a minute about how procurement teams think about these kinds of situations and some of the things that your procurement teams can do to reduce costs with your suppliers. But most often that kind of request for blanket request for repricing is done with the knowledge that only 60%, let's say, maybe a few more um, of suppliers will actually say yes. And people understand that most organizations may not be able to do that, especially right now. So it is acceptable um, to say, no, we can't do that. And in many cases, that is the right response. So I, the, there clearly is a risk with that. Um, but most often, the role of procurement is to make you perceive that the risk of saying no to that kind of request is much higher than it actually is. Now, in extremis, if companies really are struggling and really do need to cut their costs, then it may well be that you do need to take it more seriously. But that's a judgment you have to make, which is, you know, how much do they need you? How much impact do you have on their business? And how much alternative do they have working with other suppliers? So let's imagine that that's not okay and you can't just go, no. What else can we do to, um, to kind of negotiate a better response to that request for a price cut? Now, the thing about price cuts is that they are a very, very expensive way of transferring value to a customer. And when you think about the 
uh, the different negotiating variables that you have to play with, there are actually many of them. And some of them blur the line between what's selling and what's negotiation, right? So here's a few examples. Um, obviously, features, uh, training, specification, maybe co-development, depending on your business. Um, if, it's a, if it's a professional services organization like a law firm, you know, what's the structure of the team? How much partner time do you get? All of the different things that are part of a negotiation. And price is clearly one of the things that is, is a big issue around negotiation, but it's one of many. And in many cases, you can give value to the organization, in, to your customer, in a way that doesn't cost you as much, whereas price, every penny you give, is a penny less that you have. So it's important to understand when you're first asked whether you can give a, a concession on either payment terms or on price, it's important to understand why people are asking for that and then to understand what other interests they have. And those interests come from different places around the game, the buying cycle. So one set of interests in the negotiation comes from the need, the underlying need that is being met. A second set comes from the decision criteria that that company used to choose between you and your competitors or doing something internally. And the third set of, of um, uh, negotiation interests comes from risk alleviation. So in the worry stage of the buying cycle, customers are thinking about what might go wrong. And you as a salesperson are trying to figure out alleviation strategies that might involve uh, reducing the likelihood of something going wrong or putting in place something like an SLA that makes the impact less if it does. So you need to figure out using those sources, what the interests are and how they've changed as a result of coronavirus, because all of those things have shifted. Underlying needs have shifted. Some have become more important than others. Uh, decision criteria have changed. So supply chain continuity may be more important even than price now. And risk has certainly changed. So understand what the current negotiating interests might be. And, and frankly, the best way to do that um, is actually through asking questions. So here's a little structure that you could use to ask about what a customer's interests are in a negotiation. So um, on the left hand is our salesperson here. I'd like to make sure I fully understand your interests so that we can make sure that whatever we do for you is win-win, is that okay? Um, and the customer comes back and says, that's fine, but you know this, all right? But it's important to ask permission because in negotiation, you need to build trust. And trust is all about seeming, even though you're negotiating, seeming to really care about the customer's point of view as well. So asking permission is a key way to do that at the beginning of this process. And so you then you read back and you build credibility by going, okay, here's the things I know about based on what's changed in the coronavirus pandemic in your situation. And hopefully the customer goes, yep, that's about right. Um, you can then ask, have I missed anything? And uh, so in this simple example, um, uh, you know, the, he's talking about payment terms. And in, in asking the right questions, you're bringing insight by helping the customer to think through what they care about in the negotiation. And it's also true that if you share your interests because of something called reciprocity, it's actually helpful because it unlocks the customer's view and lets them talk to you more. So um, there's research that says that um, sharing your interests actually leads to 10% better outcomes. Um, so share what you care about as well, and then try to prioritize them. So which of those things are most important for you, the customer? I can't do everything you've asked for, but let me know what you really care about. And that helps you to prioritize what the customer cares about. And if you've done the same for your side, and that's where the commercial acumen part of this comes in, you need to understand what your business cares about too. Is cash more important than margin right now or vice versa, to take a very simple example. Then you can plot these things on what we call the give-get matrix. So the idea is that in a negotiation, you never give something without getting something back. So if somebody wants us to give them a price cut, we might be able to do that, but we want something back in return. And the give-get matrix is a great way to figure out what it is that might make a valid um, trade-off here. So on the vertical axis is how important 
a negotiating interest is to the buyer, to the customer, and on the horizontal axis, how important is it to us, the salespeople? And if it's important to the buyer, but less important to us, it's a give. It's something that we're happy to give to them. If it's more important to us and less important to the customer, it's a get. It's something they should be willing to give us in return. And if it's important to both parties, then it's what we call a prize. It's something that's essentially going to be fought over. And if I just throw some examples on there, you know, the classic prizes are things like price, contract terms and warranties, because they are essentially win-lose issues. Everybody cares about them. Whereas things like payment terms, staged increase in prices, service levels, may well have differential levels of value to the customer and to the salespeople. So th the game here is basically to figure out trade-offs that you can make um, between something that you care about and something that the customer cares about. So when a customer goes, can you ask, can you give me a price cut? The, the language I would recommend is, if you, then I. So if you can give me, um, or if you can accept lower service levels, for example, then I can give you a price cut. So that's my, my first piece of advice with the price cut is say no, if you can. The second is say yes, if, <laughs> right? So if you, then I. Um, and in that way, you would limit the impact on your business of these concession requests whether it's a request for a price cut or an extension in payment terms or whatever it might be. Um, somebody's just made the point that customers are also being asked to pay more. So, for example, in the packaging industry with high performance laminates, um, where there is a scarce resource, it may well be that prices are going up. And actually, I do think that in many cases right now, coronavirus is changing the balance of power in many negotiations and not always in favor of the customer. So things that used to be relatively easy to substitute one for another, and where therefore the customer had all the power, are actually becoming, in some cases, more scarce and more difficult to get hold of. And therefore, yes, the, the power might shift to the supplier. Now, the only thing I would caution here, and I, I'm afraid I don't know your name, the person who made that comment, but I, I, I think it's right. But you need to be careful, clearly, because if you are seen to be taking advantage of that, that situation, um, that will damage trust and could lead to um, you know, a longer term loss of impact, loss of uh, relationship. Now, it may well be right now, if it's about survival, that's not your primary concern. Um, and that's a business judgment that you have to make. But uh, yes, you can take advantage and, and again, you know, there are ways of doing this in a way that, um, that might lessen the impact on the customer, again, by using gives and gets. One last thing I just want to give you a thought on here, um, which you can see on the left-hand side of this diagram. When you're giving a give, it's sometimes a good idea to give a seed, something that a customer doesn't currently use, part of your service, a different, um, a different part of the service, a product they don't currently use, or even the same product to a different part of the organization that doesn't currently use you, because that might start to trigger a new buying process that will benefit you a little bit down the line. So even while you're giving value to the customer, you can do so in a way that might plant the seeds for some benefit to come back to you later on. So I've given you a couple of approaches. I want to give you one last, um, one last set of skills around this concession. Um, and we've, we've been researching negotiation for a very long time, um, ever since I first studied at Harvard under Fisher and Urey, who wrote Getting to Yes. And um, essentially, we've come up recently with a framework that is a good way to respond to a customer demand. And I, I call this the FAST framework. So imagine that a customer asks you for a concession and the best way to respond to that initially is um, to frame their request and then to pause. So by frame the request, I mean, put it in the context, not of the deal as a whole, which might make an individual request look quite small, but in the context of something that makes their request look very big. So it might be comparing the payment terms they've asked for to what's common practice in the industry, or if they want to go from 30 to 60 days, you go, that is a 100% increase in payment terms. So 
frame their request, try to understand where it's coming from, why they're asking it, and then pause. And silence, as most of you know who do negotiation, is an extremely powerful tool in any negotiation. Just stop and wait. And what tends to happen is customers will fill the gap and they'll fill it either by retracting the request or by explaining more about what they want or possibly by just downgrading the request a little bit. So frame, then pause. Then, A, advance options. So it's important not to give just one option of give, get, because of something called single option aversion. So when people are presented with just one choice, they tend to think about why that's not right for them. Whereas if they're given a choice between two options, they're much better at kind of figuring out which one of those two options works best for them. So advance multiple give, get options to the customer and say, okay, so if you do this, then we can do that. Or if you do this, then we can do that. Give people a choice. Then signal your battler. And that means don't make a massive concession all in one go, because that just lets people feel actually buyer's remorse. If you do that, people will think that they could have pushed you further. So come down in small increments, and importantly, come down in decreasing increments, because that signals that you're approaching your BATNA, which stands for best alternative to a negotiated agreement. So the closer you are to kind of not making any concession, the stronger the signal that you've reached your walkaway point. And then finally, track your gives and gets. So it's quite important to write these things down, confirm it, so that somebody can't then reopen the negotiation in a couple of weeks' time. So there you go. There's, there's some deep dive. I hope that's helpful um, just to help you think about how you deal with a request for price cuts. So the first thing is no is a good answer. Um, the, the second is um, you know, go back and think about trading off gives and gets. And the third is the way you handle that, the way you manage that process, think fast and, and apply that. doesn't mean act fast, but think that fast model and respond in a way that's going to limit the concession that you have to give. Again, obviously, we, we, in, a, in a webinar, we're not able to give you everything that there is on this or to give you a chance to practice it. But that is something that um, we would normally do. I hope you feel like that is at least an inspiration and some insight into how to deal with that particular issue. So any questions on, on that? Um, if not, we'll move on to um, handling overdue payments. A feelings commentary would be useful too. Um, so Stephen, I'm not quite sure what that question means, but that would be difficult. Oh, in terms of how, how it is to actually use these tools, you mean? Um, yes. I, and. and uh, you know, that there is a, um, oh, I see, as the frame, got you, sorry. This is kind of a one-way conversation because on the webinar version, um, everybody's muted, but I, I understand the question now. So yeah, having a, um, in the frame, you know, coming up with your response to how that makes you feel um, and, and how difficult it's gonna to be to respond to their request, I think is important. And you know what, right now, it's very interesting how we're all, seeing into each other's homes, we're seeing into each other's lives. And I do feel that that human connection is more prevalent now than it has been uh, for a long time. And I think it's okay to kind of share some of that emotion. Okay, let's talk about handling overdue payments. And I have three insights for you here around, so this is a customer that's not paid you, they're overdue late in their payment, or even are saying that they're not going to be able to pay you. So the three insights are these. Firstly, this is a strategic issue, right? It's a tactical issue, but it's also strategic because the way you handle collection issues, whether we're talking about B2B or B2C, will have a direct impact on your ability to retain customers and even whole segments post-crisis. So it is important to segment your customers and almost come up with different collection and retention strategies depending on which segment somebody falls into. The second insight is you are in competition here, right? So if somebody is late paying you, the chances are they have multiple creditors and they're late paying everybody. So what you're trying to do is not just to get them to pay, you're trying to get them to commit what available cash they might have 
to you instead of to another competitor. So it's a competition, but it's not a competition you can necessarily win by being the pushiest uh, company on the block. You need to balance the needs of the customer or the consumer with the needs of your business in an adult way. And then the third insight is this is not normal, right? So when you finally get through to whoever is responsible for this payment, chances are they're in a very heightened state of tension and they are not being a normal customer. So again, whether this is B2B, um, but especially in a B2C context, this is not a normal interaction and it needs to um, therefore flow in a different way. Um, just very quickly, there was a question on the previous slide um, from Peter saying, if procurement step in and try to put themselves between you and the client contact who recognizes your value, is this process as powerful? So um, that is a whole other module, I think, on dealing with procurement. Um, the very quick answer to that question, Peter, is procurement's job is often to be seen uh, as um, very cold and entirely focused on price. In reality, procurement has to work with their internal stakeholders. There are a range of procurement techniques that they use to, um, to uh, kind of improve results in terms of costs. And actually, I'm going to talk about that in a second when we talk about how your procurement teams can drive costs down. Um, so if you, if, you, um, uh, if you can bear with me until we get to that section, Peter, I'll, I'll kind of talk more about your question then. And Tony is asking, um, will we have a recording? And yes, we will. We'll record the rest of the whole webinar and we'll send that round to everybody. So um, don't worry about that. Um, any other questions I'll come back to shortly. Um, so let, let's just take each of those three insights in turn, if we can do. So first of all, segment strategies for collections. And um, you, you'll notice like, there are a few two by two matrices in this. This is probably because I spent many years at McKinsey and that's how your brain is rewired to work. But they are quite useful as a way of just thinking about things in an abstract form that are nevertheless very real. So think about how attractive a customer segment is to you on the y-axis there and how much exposure you have to credit risk uh, along the bottom from low to high. Now, if you have somebody that's, um, you know, low in attractiveness, but it's a relatively low balance exposure or risk of value lost, then that's something you can probably automate to a large extent. If they're not attractive, but it is a very high value at risk, then you need to have some very, very intense follow up. And there's a tendency organizations have to drop off in terms of the amount of collection effort they put in as, as debt gets later and later. In fact, you probably want to do the opposite. You want to invest more the later something becomes, especially if it's a high value um, receivable. And then if something is a, an attractive segment, something you think is going to recover well from the coronavirus outbreak, has long-term um, future potential, then if it's uh, relatively low, you just need to make sure you're in touch with those people and follow up in a regular way. If it's a very high exposure, then you need to find a way to bring something to the table um, in order to make the deal, and essentially this is a negotiation, to make that work. So that might be an extended term for payment, a reduced interest rate, some degree of forgiveness. Um, so think about by segment what your strategy is in order to alleviate some of the pain that the customer is going through, because there is gonna to have to be a give and a get here as before, in order to drive results. So you can plot your different segments or even individual customers on a matrix like this and figure out therefore how you're going to, um, to deal with them. After that, it kind of comes down to skill actually. And a lot of our research at Impasta over the last few years has focused on the 3D advantage as we call it. Uh, and that is that sales and sales negotiation and so on all rely on three dimensions to do really well. The first is insight. So in negotiation, it's do you bring insight into how you can create value for both parties in the deal? The second is influence. So can you use uh, negotiation strategy and behavioral economics and psychology to influence the outcome in your favor? And the third dimension is trust. Can you build and maintain trust with that customer? Now in a, in a negotiation context, and especially in a collection context, 
having one or maybe just two of those dimensions is not the way to go. So if all I'm doing is bringing it insight, right, and I'm kind of saying to the customer, well, if you pay me this, we could do that for you, but you're not able to actually influence the outcome, then you are what we call an eager creative, and that will often be a lose-win. So you lose, the customer wins big. Um, if you have a bit of influence, that's good. It's not the best, but it's good. You're more of a balanced deal maker. But equally, in the context of um, collections, just being aggressive and going for the win-lose, so saying you have to pay this or there's trouble, is actually not a great way to proceed because A, it will often sub-optimize the outcome and B, you'll lose trust and, and that won't help you in the long term. So I won't go through every one of these, but each of the, each of the points has its own pluses and minuses. Um, the person who is just a friendly helper just builds trust, but neither brings insight to the table nor manages to influence the customer. Um, that also is not a good outcome when you're trying to negotiate a late payment or indeed a, a deal. So it's best to be 3D, to bring insight around what's going on, to influence the customer um, to do the right thing and to build and maintain trust while that goes on. So let's take that down a level to the very tactical level around the conversation model that you need to have. And actually this conversation model works whether you are a, um, you know, working for Boeing um, or whether you're working for Barclays Bank dealing with an individual customer. And it begins with hear me. So recognize and acknowledge that heightened tension that we talked about. Show empathy and build rapport and trust. Show you are in effect listening. Then we move on to understand me where you actually try to figure out for the, from the customer what's going on. So allow them to share their circumstances and give them a chance to tell you anything that they feel is relevant. Then reassure me. So present solutions, more than one option, that are based on their situation and are meaningful for both sides. And you know, help to educate the customer. May not need it if it's a sophisticated corporate, but you'd be surprised. <laughs> you know, educate the customer about the options and what the benefits of them are. And then make it easy for them. So show that they're important by taking the time to explain the next steps. And if you can do a transaction then and there, then do that. And let me just contrast that um, with what often happens. So what often happens is tell me about what I've done wrong, um, explain why it's important that I need to pay this debt, tell me what will happen if I don't pay this debt, and then leave me to set things up or to just make the payment. So there's a really big contrast between best practice and worst practice in having that conversation um, around the, the, the collection. And, and just to give you a, a, a bit of kind of um, optimism here, the, the kind of thing that's possible when you get this conversation model right is quite impressive. So in one case in financial services, we managed to reduce the calls that were escalated um, from um, the, sorry, there's a typo there, but from the, uh, the people dealing with collections to their manager by 97%. So Basically, we stopped the need for escalation. Um, we managed to achieve 80 more promises per advisor per day to pay than before. And there was a 650% return on investment on that. So overall, um, this is something that works. And the trust that's built up as a result is actually really important. So there's a quote there um, verbatim, apart from I think she talked about a charming Scots lady who had the conversation that I took out. But... Um, you know, a charming person treats me like I wasn't a naughty child. They took on more the fact that my situation was short term and, and helped me figure out the way to deal with it. So late payment collections issues are not the end of the road. Treat it as a negotiation, balance insight, influence and trust and have that conversation in a way that maintains that trust as you go. Okay, so that is the end of that section. And I'm now going to flip it around just for the last little bit of this, and then we'll move into Q&A, um, just to talk about procurement. Now, we do actually train procurement teams, and it's, um, uh, it's an interesting place to be right now because there, there is leverage and there is help that can be given by procurement uh, to, um, to organizations to help them weather this crisis. Um, so I'm just going to very quickly, before I do that, just check in on the question. So we have... 
um, Ramiro saying how to defend own position if rest of industry is accepting the client's proposed conditions. Um, and uh, depending on how big a player you are in the industry, um, that is a you know, more or less significant question, I think. If you are in an oligopoly, then it, it, it's quite difficult um, to kind of break ranks. But if you are one of a number, um, then I think it's easier, unless there is literally no differentiation between you and the other players. So it comes down to something I'll talk about in a second, which is how the customer views you and how they segment you in terms of their suppliers. So hold that thought, Ramiro, and I'll, I'll, when I talk about the Croilet matrix, um, we'll, we'll talk about how you, how you deal with that. Um, and then somebody else has asked the question, material cost is going very low and customer is right to request price decrease. Is there a way to postpone this demand in a nice way? So that's a great question. So if input costs are going down, oil prices going negative, for example, um, you know, maybe it's appropriate to, to have a, um, a price decrease. And I think, again, here it comes back to, is this a long-term customer segment that you want to be in and you want to build and maintain trust? Sharing some of the benefit of a price drop um, is maybe not a bad idea in that situation. But um, when it comes to how you do that, you don't have to give everything away. And maybe if I can just talk about that using one of the frameworks in negotiation, and I, this is here for procurement, but is also appropriate when you're talking about sales. Uh, there are two basic schools of negotiation, right? There's principled negotiation, which is about making those trade-offs that we talked about earlier, the give-gets, uh, to make the pie bigger. So something that I care about for something you care about, and we're both better off. So that's what's called win-win or principled negotiation, and is what Fisher and Yuri wrote about in their book, um, Getting to Yes, a couple of decades ago. But the other arguably older school of negotiation is positional negotiation, it's win-lose. So um, if the price goes up, I win, you lose, right? And really, life nowadays is about balancing those two things. It's about creating what we call big win, little win. So I win, you win, I win a little bit more, but you're still happy. And that's where we're trying to get to. So in terms of um, the, the, the price increase, uh, sorry, the, where there's a, a, an input cost reduction, it may well be that you can create some win-win, but you wanna do a little bit of positional negotiation as well in order to make sure that you win just a bit more to help protect your business. Um, and a question about, please quickly run us through how to navigate pipeline refill um, in this crisis where many companies are in limbo and very slim budgets. I'll try and do that at the end if, if we have time to do that, absolutely. Okay, so I talked about the Croilet matrix and some of you will be familiar with this. It's, a, it's a, essentially a procurement strategy tool um, that is about understanding how you're gonna deal with different inputs into your business. So what's the profit impact? Is this something that has a really big impact on your business in financial terms? And how hard is it to substitute one product or supplier for another? So if it's low difficulty of substitution, so easy to swap something in or out, and low profit impact, then it's what we call shop. It's in the shop quadrant. And a good example of that would be office supplies, right? So it doesn't cost much, doesn't have a big economic impact on the business, relatively easy to swap one supplier for another. And there, that's where procurement is going to be pushing down hard on price. So going back to the question that was asked before, if you're in the shop quadrant, you may not be able to resist um, what everybody else is doing in the industry because um, you know, they can easily swap to another supplier. Uh, however, not many products are genuinely in the shop quadrant. And I think we've seen with toilet paper that even office suppliers are no longer in the, in the shop quadrant on a consistent basis. Leverage is where you have high profit impact, but it's still easy to swap one thing out for another. So cement is a good example. It's a big, it's a big part of construction costs, but you know, ready mix from one company is pretty much the same as from another. So there it's all about pushing volume into one particular supplier in return for quite big price concessions. On the other hand, if you've got something that is relatively hard to substitute, so let's take a, a specialty chemical, right, that is not a massive part of the product, but it's quite hard to swap out. There, procurement is all about managing risk. 
and trying to figure out how to um, maybe create a backup supplier in case there's a problem with the first one. When that becomes true partnership is where the profit impact is also very big. So think Dell and Intel, right? So you're, you're buying in chips that are a massive part of what you do and a big cost and hard to substitute because they're baked in. Um, and that's where you really need to align the interest between both parties um, because everybody kind of rises or falls together. So as before, we can kind of plot different, um, uh, different products on that. And if you're looking at, I'm now I'm talking about procurement, not sales. So as a procurement team, if you've not done this, or if your procurement team hasn't done a, a supplier segmentation and built a procurement strategy, then they should. Because right now you don't want to be putting price pressure onto the partners. You probably don't want to be putting price pressure onto the managed risk too much. But the leverage and the shop quadrants are areas where you might well want to try and apply a little bit of pressure and see what happens. One of the ways to do that is something called rapid repricing. Um, and we kind of talked about this from the other side when we were talking about how salespeople deal with price cuts. But from a procurement point of view, you could just ask for a price cut or an extension in payment terms. So here's a, a very typical letter. Dear supplier, your company is one of many valued suppliers to our organization. Thank you for your support to date. So that's building a bit of trust and showing that you're not entirely self-oriented, although it's maybe that's going to go away when you see what comes next. As is true for many organizations at the moment, we're reviewing our purchasing priorities and policies within the context of coronavirus. This letter is to inform you that the outcome of the review is to implement whatever it is, 60 day payment terms or a 2% price reduction with all suppliers. And we have already agreed this with a significant proportion of suppliers. So you're influencing the outcome by providing clarity, but also a degree of social proof, saying that some people have already um, agreed to this. And when people are under pressure and there's uncertainty, they tend to follow the herd a little bit more than they would normally do. So we'll begin this policy on so-and-so date. If you can't do that, then please let us know so that we can take appropriate action in advance. And that, again, is influenced by what's called, well, essentially it's a mild threat. It's, it's triggering a sense of loss aversion. So that kind of letter, um, and I have to give credit to, um, to um, a, a friend of ours called Jonas Olsen, who was a very senior procurement person who, who kind of helped us to understand a lot of these tactics. And, and that letter um, in his organization was able to achieve sometimes as much as 80% agreement from suppliers. And going back to what we said earlier, when suppliers said no, often it was like, well, okay, we, we actually didn't expect it to get a yes from everybody. And there may well not have been um, the, uh, the same impact. Actually, she's asking how relevant is the context for, for service delivery? I, I, I think a lot of these things are equally relevant in professional services um, as in a product-based company. I mean, you, you are still um, having to negotiate sales. The only difference here is that your biggest cost may well be people rather than input materials. Um, and uh, that is to some extent harder to negotiate. Although, you know, these days, a lot of organizations are having to go back to their staff and actually negotiate some kind of concession to help the organization to survive through um, the virus and the, pan and the, um, the recession. So um, beyond that, I, there are 10 um, procurement strategies that are very useful in this kind of situation. And I, I don't have time to go through these in great detail, but I wanted just to kind of share you them at a high level, and then you, we can either talk more or you can research these. So the first is best alternative to a negotiated agreement, FATNA. Exaggerate theirs, minimize yours. I'm, I'm giving an extreme version of these tactics. Um, you can be an aggressive hard bargaining counterpart. You can drop and hold aggressive anchors, which is setting a very low expectation on price. And that anchor tends to shift the, the frame of the conversation to take account of that. And so you'll end up with a, a lower price at the end. You can refuse to reveal your interests if you want to make it a very positional negotiation. Um, you can try to ignore concessions. You can offer future gains and returns for concessions now. Again, this is largely done from the sales point of view, but some of these tactics, I wouldn't say all of them, but some of them can be quite viable um, from a procurement point of view as well. And then there are other ones. So best of the best pricing, which I'm gonna give you an example of, is where you compare a supplier to 
in effect a phantom competitor, again, I'll explain that more in a second, you can claim limited authority. I can't concede this because it's our standard terms or my boss won't let me. You can, if you want, create time pressure or mental discomfort with a supplier and make them uncertain with that veiled threat. Um, you can use nibbling, so you can make assumptions, you can ask for extras, and you can reopen, so you can reach agreement and then um, have a new stakeholder come in or say that the situation's changed and everything goes back on the table. Now, again, most of the time, we're helping salespeople to deal with these tactics, but when you know, there's a genuine crisis going on, if it's a matter of survival, some of these um, may well be helpful for you. Let me just... Um, let me just talk about best of the best pricing because that's kind of interesting. So in best of best pricing, what you do is you get prices broken down into different components uh, from a range of different suppliers. So here, this is a made up case study, um, Lee Pella, Mega Recruit, Grey Track, and these are different recruiting companies. And you can see there are different components here, uh, recruiting costs, engagement consulting, engagement monitoring and, and payment terms. And what the buyer is doing here is basically going, I'm going to pick the very best number from each of these three competitors and use that to create a new competitor called best of best. So the cost of the three suppliers is $225,000 in this case, $180,000 and 225. But if you take the best of each row and add those together, you come up with $120,000. And then what you do is you go back to each supplier and you say, here is um, the benchmark that you have to reach on each of those components. Now, we've got four components here. In some complex procurement situations, there might be a couple of hundred line items of price. So the best of best approach creates uncertainty. It creates pressure to reduce price in certain areas. Um, even though you're not really comparing people to a real competitor, you're comparing to this phantom composite competitor. But this approach can yield savings of between 30 and 50% um, on, a, on a purchase um, program. So again, I, I, I feel quite evil kind of sharing some of these tactics, but where um, it's a matter of survival, this can be a very powerful tool. Uh, there are ways to push back against it as salespeople, but it can be a very powerful tool nevertheless to try and get the best price um, in a difficult situation. So again, in, in negotiation, it's all about bringing insight um, through give and get trade-offs, making the pie bigger, using tactics like best of best to um, capture a bigger share of value uh, through the application of these kind of techniques, but also where you can to maintain trust. So that is the end of the deep dives and again just to come back to this diagram these are the the kind of the key areas that we identified and i think based on your um priorities that you kindly shared with us earlier um i will um you know we may well kind of add a couple more and and, and retire a couple of these um but this uh, i'm hoping should be up on our website imparter.com now and if you uh, if not, it will be a bit later on this evening. So maybe tomorrow, take a look at this. And, and if there's stuff there that we can talk further with you, then um, we'd be really, really happy to do that. So um, I've put my email address there. Rachel, um, who you met at the beginning of this, is our marketing manager. Rachel's email is there, as is Nigel Webb. And Nigel is uh, Imparter's chief client officer. Um, and any of us would be super happy to, uh, to discuss your issues with you and potentially how we could help. Uh, we also have a new um, open course. We don't normally do open courses. Uh, most of our work is with organizations running kind of tailored in-house programs. But uh, at the moment, we are finding there's quite a lot of call for open courses around especially virtual selling. So there's a new one up on our website that's um, on the 26th of May. It's a half-day virtual course. Uh, you're welcome to put one or two people on that if you would like. Um, and with that said, thank you very much indeed for your um, time and attention. I, I really do hope um, that it's provided you with some thoughts on how best to deal with some of these critical interventions. If there is demand, we can run another of these focusing on maybe some of the other ones. Um, but I, I, really, um, I really hope that's been helpful. Our intention here, our, our mission right now, as well as to survive as in Parta, is to help 
salespeople and sales leaders to survive and thrive through the very intense challenges that coronavirus is giving us. So I hope today that we've gone some way to do that. Um, thank you very much indeed. And let me ask for any other questions. There was, there was one question there that was about how you would do a pipeline refill. Um, uh, so while you guys are, are putting more questions in, I will, um, I'll take some time to answer these now. Um, and thank you very much for all of you saying thank you. <laughs> it's great to, great to see you friends and new friends and people coming back for more. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, so yeah, in terms of refilling the pipeline, I think um, one, of, one of the key things is about segmentation again. So which opportunities are going to provide you with uh, relatively quick wins? So, you know, clearly there are some sectors that are very, very much struggling right now, and not just things like aerospace and automotive, but the, um, the, the organizations that supply those companies are also struggling. So I think choose your battles. Um, find things that are genuinely urgent and important to them. So much as we're doing with these business critical interventions, you know, selling the product that you normally sell, there'll be some people who still want it, but the more you can reformulate that to be addressing really urgent issues, the better you're going to be able to cut through uh, and get through to people at a time when there's a lot of pressure and a lot of competition for budget and for headspace. And then after that, there, there are a whole range of skills that work in prospecting. Um, uh, I think the, the one thing that we talked about in the last webinar that did talk about that a little bit is just the power of referrals. So um, only about 11% of salespeople regularly ask for referrals. Most customers are willing to give them. So introduce me to somebody else who might need the same thing that we're doing for you. And people are five times more likely to engage with the salesperson to whom they've been introduced. So if I can offer one very quick tip, it would be get your sales team, or if you're a salesperson, get out there and try and get some referrals to other people who have an urgent need um, with which you can help. Beyond that, there is a whole range of stuff. Take, take a look at the website um, around that business critical intervention and hopefully you'll find some interesting ideas there around how to, um, how to refill the pipeline. Uh, in terms of approach or tactics, somebody's asking, uh, Abdallah is asking how we um, deal with best of best strategy. And it, that is a tricky one. I mean, it's one of the hardest um, strategies to actually push back against. There are a couple of approaches. Um, the first is to call it out for what it is and to say, um, you know, look, this, this is a phantom competitor. There is, that's not actually on the table as a deal, is it? Um, and then I would say, you know, no give without a get. So if you're making concessions, and essentially it's a request for a concession, that's fine. Uh, but try and get a get back for every give that you make and don't give everywhere. So if you are making a price cut, make it an area where your margin is relatively high rather than um, in an area where the margin is quite thin and ask for something in return, whether that's payment terms or you know, an extended contract or a longer contract period, whatever it might be. And then the other thing you can do is to try and avoid that situation in the first place is don't break your pricing down into a super detailed spreadsheet. Try to resist that if you possibly can. Um, Joshua is saying, I really enjoyed listening. Is there any possibility to purchase a book or the mentioned cards? So the, the, the card deck, um, uh, for, for larger organizations, we'll, we'll send you a, a copy of the card deck. And essentially what that does is show what the different skills are. There's about 80 or 90 of them. Here is the, here is the card deck. Um, and those, those are the kind of the different skill modules that we offer in our curriculum. They will be more talking about kind of what skills are covered rather than actually how to do it. Uh, we are writing... Oh, I am writing two books at the moment, one on three-dimensional selling and the other on three-dimensional negotiation. Um, so uh, maybe I could ask Rachel when we send out a note after this um, to uh, just include a link. I think we have a pre-sign-up page on the website, don't we? Um, yeah. Okay, great. So if Rachel will pop that into the email and then if you want to sign up for there, we'll let you know when the book is written. I have to say... <laughs> 
keeping the business going has been something of a full, full time job. So there hasn't been much book writing going on in the last couple of months, but I'm hoping to get back to it quite soon. There was one question from um, Diane who oh. asked, everyone at, is at home, any tips for reaching people who are not at their desks? Um, that's a great question. So how do you reach people? And sometimes getting through to the right people is, is key. I mean, clearly Zoom and, and other video conferencing tools are a, a good way to, to reach people. I guess, I guess your question is more about how do you, um, how do you get people to agree to have a Zoom meeting in the first place, right? You, you do, I mean, you, the, these still work. So you can make calls to people, you can send emails to people. Um, in our training material, we talk a lot about how you construct messages in a way that's going to cut through to people. Um, and so that's not just about the, the topic, but it's about how you, how you construct the email. So, you know, think down to don't include attachments um, because that will tend to get you trapped in a spam filter. Don't put questions into the subject line because the research shows that counterintuitively, although that works as a sales technique, asking questions, it doesn't work so well in the subject line of an email and so on. Um, so, uh, Diane, if, if, you, if you pop um, either me, I'll put my email address back up here, either me or Rachel a note, I, I, I'll, I'll send you a couple of thoughts on um, how best to do that um, and how to get through to people. But ultimately, you know, if, some, if you want somebody to have a conversation with you, you've got to focus on selling the conversation, not on selling whatever it is you want them to buy. Um, and that is a value transaction. So they give you time, which is a cost to them, and they get something back, which is a value to them. And it's important to make a proposition, if you like, for the conversation that has something that they genuinely value. And that might be personal. It might be, I want to stay in touch with what's going on in the industry. I'd like to talk to somebody who's an expert in a particular area, figure out what their hot buttons are and use that to get through. The, the rest, I think, is just technology, with, you know, what, what format you use to, um, to actually have that conversation. Um, Peter, thank you very much. That is uh, very kind of you. Best session he's participated in for a long time. I'm, I'm very grateful to hear that. And um, that's, that's what we're here. We, we're <laughs> here to help and hopefully to, um, to add some value. So I'm very glad to hear that we've done that. Thank you. And I think, I think with that said, oh, there's, there's um, um, Bernadette as well. Thank you very much. Uh, to, 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 in the time of crisis, so Katazina, I think that's pronounced. In the time of crisis, supplier and buyer may be in a difficult situation. Buyer will ask many suppliers who will receive many such requests and possibly cannot say yes to them all. Could the supplier shop the buyer strategically? Yeah, I, I, it goes back to a conversation that we had earlier. I think if you have some degree of scarce resource, now that might be laminates, it might be uh, you know, channels on a satellite where there's only a finite number of channels, it might be your time as a salesperson, right? In all of those situations, there is a degree of rationing that you can do and prioritization. So you know, in the first few weeks of the virus, I think everybody was everybody shut shop. And, and not a lot was happening. Right now, I think everybody is extremely busy. And in many cases, I'm hearing about more activity going on, not say more money, but more activity and more requests for help than ever. So I think, yes, now is a good time to segment your customers and decide where you're going to spend your time, um, as well as doing some of the other things that we've talked about today. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, I think we're at time pretty much, so we will call it an afternoon. I'll leave you hopefully to go out into the sunshine if you have a chance to get a walk, stretch your legs. We're all getting Zoom burnout these days, so it's good to um, try and get a bit of exercise as well. I wish you all the very best and um, please do get in touch if there's anything we can help you with. Um, but in the meantime, I, um, I leave you with thank you, stay safe and keep selling. And um, Please stay in touch. Thank you very much. And thank you, Rachel, for, for hosting the session very, very well. Thanks, Richard. Take thank care, everybody. For joining. All bye the best. Bye.